to worship in one accord to praise and glorify your name we worship you for who you are you are the great God and you are our great father we thank you today for your great redemption and we thank you for your great salvation you have drawn us to yourself by your precious blood and today we are counted as your children we share in every blessing of our heavenly father and for this reason Lord we lack nothing good this morning and for this reason we praise and glorify you Lord as we listen from you today help everyone in this place to find their way in you and to find their peace and calm in the promise of the word of God we worship you and we bless you in Jesus name we pray Amen Amen Hallelujah we may be seated thank you so much singers thank you you may be seated thank you Jesus hallelujah I thank God this morning and I thank God for you too uh, we are visited today by our pastor Nyale praise the Lord and uh, his wife Sarah can we give the Lord a clap offering for them amen they say they wanted to come and be with us and just be blessed together with us. So we are so honored to have you around. Thank you so much. I want us to go to the book of Revelation right away. Those who have been here, you know we have been taking a journey in the book of Revelation. I'm through the book of Re Revelation. And we, started, we started from the beginning and now we are somewhere in chapter 2. You can still bring it a little bit down up here. My monitors are too high. Yeah, so we, we, we started the journey from the first chapter. We are in chapter two. But I promised you every time we do this, we will be touching from the beginning. Praise the Lord. And uh, I was challenged this week. We were having our Bible school this week. And some of the students said, Pastor, why don't we have Bible school in church? So that what we are doing in class, we can do it when everybody is in church. And I thought that was a good idea. We may not be, may not be able to effectively do classwork in church, but we can try. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm still waiting for him. We can still try and do that. Chapter 1 of the book of Revelation speaks about what? Shout it, you know. We did this on Tuesday. What does it speak about? the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ praise the Lord who gave that revelation God gave it to who to Jesus to give it to who to his servants starting with John praise the Lord amen chapter 2 and 3 speaks about what the history or the age of the church and that's where we are now praise the Lord the seven letters to the seven churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3 speak and about the entirety of the history of the church are you listening so the church history from the day of pentecost because from the cross to the day of pentecost that was the period of the birth of the church that short period of 50 days the cross of, up to the pentecost the church is born in the power of the holy spirit to the last day that the last believer will confess their life in Jesus then Jesus comes and raptures the church that is called the church age from his beginning to its climax because after the rapture then we begin the other chapter in chapter 1 verse 19 that says the things that will happen here after so chapter 1 John receives the revelation of Jesus chapter 2 and 3 John is given the revelation of the church and the letters to the church so that the church age so uh, chapter 1 verse 19 says write the things that you have seen then you write the things that are then you write the things that will happen here after and those things happen 
from chapter 4 here after after the rapture john is living and is writing during the time of the church so we are still in the time of the church and the time of the church will come to an end with the rapture and then we will be joined with the lord for the lamps the lamp supper praise the lord so it's important now to give attention to the time we are in because when you study about the times that are coming the rapture and the end times it may not be very important if you will not be part of it praise the lord so how do you make sure you are part of part of it is that during the period of the church we are to preach the gospel so that many people may know christ we are to preach the gospel and teach the gospel so that the believers may be established we are supposed to grow in Christ so that we can become tools and vessels for God during the church age and is the time that we are living in and during this time there has been different aversions taking place and because of that the church somehow misses out on some very important aspects that God would want us to have and they are shown clearly in the seven books and we started by the book of Ephesians but before we go back there we have seen that chapter 1 is the revelation of Jesus chapter 2 and 3 is church history or the age of the church then chapter 4 to chapter 5 church in heaven church has been caught up it's in heaven and it's the bema seat and we are receiving rewards chapter 4 and chapter 5 then chapter 6 to chapter 19 the tribulation you know its forms so in chapter 4 and 5 we are in heaven we are in the heavens with the lord we have been caught up with we are where he is we are together with jesus and we are being rewarded and at the same time simultaneously chaos, chaos are happening on the face of the earth the antichrist has been revealed and the things you see in chapter 6 to 19 don't speak about you if you will have been raptured praise Jesus they speak about the people so then the big chunk of the book of Revelation from chapter 6 to chapter 19 the scary stuff church reads there and think it concerns them is for the purpose of information so that that information may impact your actions now so that the information you see about those who will be left behind and in case you are left behind and those who will have rejected Jesus and they will be there, they will have an opportunity now there to go and to face the challenges of the tribulation with the message they had during the time of grace. Yeah. Praise the Lord. But for you who are, who are born again, can I see hands of them who are born again? Shout a bigger man if you are born again. Yeah. It's a glorious moment to know that when you're born again and you have, you have received the salvation of the Lord, you have received his forgiveness, you're counted worthy to not go through the issues of chapter 6, chapter 6 to chapter 19. I want to be with the Lord up there watching the scenes of what is happening on the face of the earth. And that's what God has prepared us to, to be able, he's preparing us by his blood, by his goodness, to be partakers of that good thing. And then chapter 20 speaks about what? The millennium. Praise the Lord. Chapter 21 and chapter 22, the new heaven and the new earth. Can we give ourselves a good clap offering? A good clap because uh, give yourself a good clap if you're following <laughs> praise the lord amen so why do we study the book of revelation we study the book of revelation so that we be we may be awakened to the truth so that we can be alive to the truth why so that we are not deceived by strange waves of doctrine around us and in, in, the, in the letters, you will see those doctrines say there, because today we are going to reach there, so that you are stable, you are strong. You are strong when you have physical blessings and when you don't have them. You are established, even when you're going through persecutions and hard times. But this is the truth, brothers and sisters. Although we trust the Lord to deliver us from all things, you will see in scripture that even faithful men went through hard times and they were happy that they were counted worthy to go through those things for their defense of the gospel. 
They stood firm to defend the truth of the word of God. And by standing there, they were whipped, they were killed, they were martyred, and some of them were sown asunder. But they did not give in to the pressure of the enemy. Why? The greater one lived in them. The secret of overcoming in life is to have Christ revealed in your heart. In such a clear manner that you are willing to even give your life for what you believe in. And until you are ready to die for something, you are not ready to live for it. Because it's a step that should bring you to a place where Christ is so big. Christ has become such an integral part of your life. You can't live without him. You can't live without his experience in your life. He is greater and bigger than your friends, greater and bigger than your brothers. He is greater and bigger than your father and mother. He has become the pivotal thing in your life. That is the secret that will cause you to face your challenges, yet praise him. To face anything in life, yet continue to, to praise him. So we saw in Ephesians, Jesus, in every book, he had something to say, something positive to say positive affirmation to give to them and he also had some corrective exhortations to them and then he had some revelation some some bit of revelation about who christ is he would say to every church i am him who was and is and is to come him who was dead and is now alive praise the lord giving partial revelation of himself so that every church knows i am at the center of the church I'm in control of the church. I am not say, revealing these things for you to be scared. I'm revealing them for you to be established. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are we together? So, let's go to the Bible chapter 2 now. And we, we continue with our journey. We are not beginning it. And I hope you are enjoying this book. And we promised we are, we are sticking with it. We are sticking with it until we get there. Amen. Yeah, and if you're writing, you continue writing. Let me say one bit in verse 6, in chapter 2, verse 6, about the church of Ephesus. But this you have, that you had the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also had. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who, who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I will repeat that again. And we can read it together. One, two, three, let's go. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. How many, how many are hearing the tree of life for the second time here? When did you hear it for the first time? In Genesis. So Jesus says, to him who does what? Hears. And let, uh, to him who overcomes, praise the Lord, I will do what? I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, that brings you to the beginning. It tells you God's intention was that he forever lives with man in close fellowship intimacy with him so he's saying i know we know he had said i know your works i know your persecutions but he says he who overcomes when we have received the revelation of jesus christ we are empowered to overcome everything that may stand on our way in our service of our lord jesus christ it is the revelation the knowledge that's why chapter one begins with revelation and i've emphasized this again and again when your heart gets to know him not mentally you see him as he is with your spiritual eye you begin to understand who christ is immediately there is an empowerment that is able to keep you from being defeated and that's why in in that same church he said come back those who have left the first love, not those who have lost, those who have left, left. They have deliberately chosen other things other than the initial passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you have left on your own, you can walk back there. It means it was a decision not to continue in the journey because God has given you everything you need to overcome. 
Can somebody shout amen? You know, believers think there is something that needs to happen to me for me to overcome. When you are born again, you are born from above. And if you are born from above, you have God's DNA in your system. But God cannot force his power, force you to act accordingly because God has given you free will. And God respects you. You are created in the image of God. You can say no and God can do nothing about it. Because God has all power, but he limited himself by making a man in his own likeness. And by that, he risked losing the man. Because if, you're not, if God didn't want to lose you, he simply needed to make you a robot. Yeah. So that when he says, come, you come running. It's just like a car. A car is a robot. Until you ignite it and drive it, then it never goes anywhere. But the moment you put it on autopilot, like the pilots, when they put a plane on autopilot, if you don't disengage the autopilot, you cannot pilot it. Because it becomes a robot. It's going, using another brain, not your brain. God did not want us to be robots. And that's why human beings have the power to decide to live for God. And they have the power to decide to not live for God. We have the power to decide to accept God's word. And I want this to go into your spirit. As you leave this church tonight, today, as you go home, remember you have the power and you are where you are because of the decisions you make. People will say, God did not bless me. That will never hold water in eternity. Jesus came and died for you. He acquired everything for you. And he said, if you believe in me, I will come to live in you. And now greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And God knows you have the power to overcome the devil. Can you shout after me? I have the power. Shout like you. I have the power. Some of you are talking like it is the spirit who has the power. You have the power. Shout with me, I have the power to overcome. Jesus is bold. He says, he who overcomes. And I shout with him, I can overcome. I am an overcomer. The moment you stop giving excuses and turn back to yourself and say, if he lives in me, I have the ability to decide right. You begin to see success in your life. You begin to see progress in your life. If you have been fat lazy, waking up lazy and you're complaining, I don't see anything good happening for me. Change your mind and things will change around you. Some still continue to allow thoughts like, I come from a bad background. I was not given anything when my father and my mother went to, to or died. I was not given any inheritance. I was not given any education. I was not given this. Nobody gave me this. Nobody gave me this. You know what you're trying to look for? You're looking for excuses. And excuses only justify failure. Excuses are the easiest way to justify your failure. Stop justifying your failure by giving excuses. Turn around and say, Jesus demands of me to overcome. Because he has paid every price for me like he has paid for everybody. Jesus did not pick somebody to be an overcomer. He said, whoever, shout whoever. Whoever includes you and me. And that's why I have no business. You have no business giving an excuse. As the things, and we are going to see in the church of Smyrna. Because that's where we are dwelling today. This church was going through hell. It was going through issues. And I told you the bishop of that church was Polycarp. And he was a man who lived 86 years. He died around AD 155 after having been ordained by John the Apostle as the bishop of Smyrna. And he stays there. And he is standing his ground. And he's finally killed. He's put on stocks. He was, he's, he's tied on a wood. And they put oil around him. And they light him. And he's not getting burned. So one of the soldiers just plunge his spear into, in, in between his collarbone and his neck and the blood comes out and it quenches the entire fire and before he dies he's asked do you really mean you want to die you are refusing to worship the emperor at the expense of your life then he, he proclaimed the greatest proclamation before his death the last words before his death he said I have served the Lord for 86 years I cannot deny him now. Praise the Lord. And then he went to be with the Lord as a matter. And that is the church we are coming into. What am I saying? That is the church Jesus is saying, overcome. 
Why is he so bold? Some of us are overcome by lack of money. Some of us are overcome by a delay in a, in a, in a marriage spouse. Some of us are overcome by a small delay in getting a job. And you are behaving so moody. One wonders, if you belong to this church, would you ever really be a born again believer? And why is the book so important? It's to jack everybody to realize there is nothing I'm going about that Jesus doesn't think I have power to overcome. If you've been thinking, Lord, seriously, I need your deliverance, I will show you men who say, please deliver me not. So that I may be counted as a great fighter for our Lord. In other words, I want to die so that I may join Peter in the cadre of the martyrdom. Now you are very quiet because you know what the church knows? The church knows everything is going to be like this. And sadly, they discover it's never like that. Some men have discovered sometimes that's a lie. Let me see. Maybe I'm preaching to people who don't believe it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's true. The blessings of God are present. They are there. But God never wants us to be pointed to them. In the entire seven letters, you don't see any material blessings commented. You know why? You do not have to worry about the fruit if you have the right seed and the right soil. Don't teach fruit if you have the right seed and right soil. If a believer gets the word of God into their spirit and they are in an environment of worship, environment of serving the Lord, environment where they are growing in the inside, you will never discuss success in their life. It's an automatic happening. But the moment a believer turns their mind to the success of things, then you lose the seed and you lose the environment. And then what happens is a product of people who have things but they have no power in the inside of them. And Jesus is not looking for that. He would rather have one person truly born again, loving him, living for him, not having as much, but he is willing to die for him. He will use that more to, to change a generation but to, than to use a billionaire who knows nothing about spiritual matters. How many can say amen to that? Oh, but pastor, we want the material blessing. You don't need to want them. You, we know you do. I too need some good things in my life. But they are never supposed to be your focus. Jesus should always be central. He's the creator of heavens and earth. Do you agree, church? I mean, no God owns all things. Praise the Lord. You know God owns all things? For whom does he own all things? For himself and his family. But how do you prove you're part of his family? Not by claiming what you already have. You remember the prodigal son? Yeah. Did he have everything? Yeah. Talk to me, church. Did he have everything? Yeah. What was his mistake? To want to have what he already has. And what was the problem of the older son? To not know what he has. Why? The church has everything it desires in the Lord Jesus Christ. In him all things hold together. He knows. God knows us. But he is interested in our hearts. Because when your heart is flowing with the love of God, the desire to do the will of God, he will bless you at a place of supply. And when he places you at a place of supply, you are not confused in life. But if you get too much teachings about things and not too much teachings about the Lord Jesus, then your mathematic is upside down. Your formula is reversed. And what you get is things that begin to choke you. They are no longer the gifts of the Lord. Praise the Lord. I know this is not popular, but that's what we are seeing. Let's now go to the word of God. He says, he says, uh, overcome, I will give you to eat the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise. It's at the center. I will give you to be at the center of my purpose. You will enjoy the things that matter most. You will be where my heart is. Praise the Lord. What a greater place to be. And you can be there in this life. You are blessed with so many things. But Christ is still the one thing that matters the most. Amen. 
Praise the Lord. And as I finish on that segment, I told you, ask those who have gotten things. After you get them, they lose their flavor. They only have a flavor before you get them. Oh, I want to have this. The day you get it, you realize it's not good enough. Only Jesus is good enough. Hallelujah. And wherever you are, you are to praise God at that state that you are in. And expect that he's going to show himself great and mighty in your life. And you develop your fellowship with him. Because you have discovered, I am not just called to get the things. Because if I just get the things, I will lack the joy of my Lord. You get, Paul said, I desire to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Praise the Lord. That he may be exalted in me. That me and him may have a fellowship. May have such oneness. That no matter what comes my way. Because even the richest. Even the most endowed. They go through issues. How will you handle your issues? There are issues that cannot be handled by money. A lot of them. You cannot buy peace anywhere. Praise the Lord. May the Lord speak to us as we read through. Amen. So I will give him to read that. But now, I want you to jump to the second church. is the church of Smyrna. And I will read from verse 1. And to the angel, we say the angel is who? I'll keep asking you so that we may know. Who is the angel? The messenger. It could mean the overseer. Or it could mean the guardian angel. Because God has two people. We know angels. When the devil fell, he fell with a third of the angels. Right? And they became who? Demons. Are we together? So, simple mathematics, if you went to class 1, 2, 3, you know, if they were, if they were, they were 90 angels, and a sad fell, how many remained? 60. So, naturally, of all the angels God created, two-thirds remained with God. They are even, they are even more by numerical numbers. What does that tell you? Even if the angels were to fight, God's angels will still win. While there are more. Two thirds versus one third. Right? Praise the Lord. So, after this, after the, 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 the church of Ephesus, dealing with the church, he says, and he, and to the angel, we say the angel, there is a guardian angel. So, the angels of God serve believers. Is that okay? Yeah. So, the interpretation of this is either the angel assigned to the church of Smyrna or the messenger who is the overseer the pastors and the overseer of the church and we knew the bishop of the overseer of the church was, was Polycarp we already know by, by now so that letter has been written to those are the recipients write this these things says the first and the last. Jesus is giving himself again a revelation to that church. Who is writing, church? The first and the last. That is Jesus' introduction to every church. Not an ordinary, the first you are being written to by the deity, by the one who was and is and is to come. He who was dead and is, uh, is risen from the dead. He who was dead and has come back to life. Verse 9. And I know your works. On Tuesday we dealt with this. I know what? Talk to me, church. Praise the Lord. I encourage you to use your mouth in church. We were just asking ourselves, how was Jesus teaching during his time? He, was just, he would just be teaching. Jesus, the great teacher, would just be teaching. And anybody would be free to say, Lord, I have not understood. And then they would, he would stop there and teach them. You know, there was freedom and liberty in learning the word of God. Praise the Lord. So Jesus said, I know your works. Works matter. I know your works. Can you just touch your neighbor with your elbow ask them, what are your works? What works does God know about you? You know, sometimes we over-spiritualize this and we forget to know after you're born again. We do, God doesn't, doesn't recognize your works as a basis for salvation. Praise the Lord. But after you're born again, there is a clear record. God talks and says, write that down. I know what you did on Tuesday for the kingdom. I know how you wake up to pray for brother. I know how you give. I know your works. I know God has a record of everyone about what you do in the kingdom of God. There wouldn't be need for reward if there is no record for, for, for what we did in the kingdom. Amen. 
Are you lazy in the kingdom? You will be bo so bored in the seven years you are going to be up there. Your work will be to clap. You hear? Brother Ezra stands up. He's being crowned wonderfully. And you're walking, oh, oh, thank you. Because there's no hatred in heaven. You will clap until your, your, your hands go sore. <laughs> oh, Brother John. He's being crowned. Seven years. And then later on you realize... And ask Lord, no crown, no, no reward. And then people, I say to you the other day, people will say, oh, but like, I'll be very happy I've entered. And then I gave you a simple analogy. Can you imagine you've entered, you are, you are the last in that place you have entered. And when people are being given 10 cities, they're being crowned, they're being, you realize you have nothing. It is an encouragement. I know your works. I take notice of your effort in the kingdom. Your labor in the kingdom is noticed by God and it shall matter in eternity. You are here for 70, for 70 years, 80 years, and sometimes you face issues. Only 70 years. And it is such a heavy burden to keep up with only 70 years. How will you keep up with eternity when you are the last? That is not for condemnation. It is for the purpose of telling you, you need to let your day, your time, your money, your decisions count so that the Lord can say, I know your works. This is important. Tell your neighbor, God knows your works. God is recording your works. No, no, talk to them. Why are you having mercy on them? Tell them, God is recording your works. I'll tell them this way. God is noticing your labor. God is noticing your contribution in the kingdom. God records your... Everybody should be encouraged. Now, right now, right now, right now, God is recording my contribution in the kingdom. And it's very important that I make sure I do it to the best of my ability. It's very important I make sure I'm not holding back. I'm giving it to you even when sometimes it's uncomfortable. And you're supposed to do the same. God has given you a place to function. God will tell you that day, I know your works. And I will show you some people He said, I know your works. Your people who have gone into Kahoot with the, with the Nicolaitans. And he says, I hate those guys. So every time I see you joining them, I feel bad. So I know your works. Even the bad works for the believer, when you do not do, when you, there are sins of omission, you refuse to do what you know you're supposed to do. Jesus will feel like, you did not do what I wanted you to do. Jesus loves you. God is both gracious and is also just. Gracious and just God. And he cannot change. He loves you. He paid the price for your redemption for free. But it comes to the other side. Justice. If you, after you're born again, you never made the right decision. You're told it's important to give. You don't. It's important to serve. You don't. You don't do it. You don't do it. You don't do it. The justice of God will not place you at the same level with them all yielded to the, work of, to the call of God. And they did what God wanted them to do. So in eternity, God's justice will be seen. And you know the good thing? The eyes of the Lord which flame with fire shall be the judgment position, judgment parameter, the, 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 the platform for God's judgment. He will not be saying, I hate you. No, no, no. That judgment there is not for condemnation. It's judgment for placement. It is justice for placement. It is justice for everyone. Praise the Lord. So the Lord will look at us as he sits in the beamer seat and he looks at you and everybody places themselves at their place of crowning. His eyes will penetrate you and you will know I am number last. Then you go for it. mtu na kupeleka, unaenda mwenyewe, unapanga huku kwa mukia nyuma. Alafu wale ambao, you are committed in the kingdom of God. My brother, every day must be a giving process to generate something in the kingdom. Every day must be, because it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You've received everything you need to give, and you give your life to Jesus. And he can't force you. That's why there will be rewards. He 
cannot demand it. He will advise you. He will talk to you. And he will convict you. And when you hold and you agree to it, you yield to him. Then you will be rewarded for everything you do. Let's give Jesus a clap offering for his faithfulness. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, he says, these things I say, uh, I don't know, verse 9, I know your works. I know your, let's shout it. Uh, is it there, sister? I know your, I, I, let's read together. I know your works. I also know your, every challenge you go through. Praise the Lord. I mean, I've been in a hardship because you're born again. You know this situation, I went through it because I'm born again. That's called tribulation. Every tribulation you go through, Jesus is aware. The creator of the heavens and earth is aware. You are accused falsely, falsely, sorry, falsely. It's not that you are, you are guilty, but you are stoned and you are hated. I know the tribulation. I know the poverty, but you are rich. Listen, I know you feel like I don't have this. Sister Emma, you feel like I, I feel like I have nothing. But Jesus is saying, you are. So you read it with me. Praise the Lord. I know you are poverty. I know your lack. It's like we are giving today, those who do not give on Sunday, we are giving some food and some unga. We are accompanying Apostle Ndumbu to go to Bamba to give food there. So if you do not give your unga, you don't give your whatever, we are giving this day, that unga may go there. Those guys may look poor, right? But Jesus, if they are there who are standing in the truth of the word of God, Jesus says, but you are rich. Jesus sees riches beyond the eye. You are rich in me. Praise the Lord. So but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. You remember, to be a true Jew is not to be born physically by Abraham, in the lineage of Abraham. The true Jew is a Jew at heart. That's why Paul says the, the outside circumcision doesn't matter more than the inward circumcision. Those who agree with Jesus, they are more Jews than physical Jews. That's what he's trying to say. So that, because they were somewhere where there is, a, there is a group, they were in areas where there are a lot of Jews around them and these people come to enforce their will of the law to them. But he says they are not but a synagogue of Satan. Praise the Lord. Continue down there. Continue. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Hallelujah. Do not do what? Jesus knows you're about to go through the, some issues. How many know in your life as you walk, your expectation must be, I'm expecting good things to happen in my life, and even if bad things or negative things happen in me, I'm more than over, an overcomer. So you're not just confused in an absurd expectation. You're living the normal life. For example, that's why we put on masks today. We don't like it. When you put on, I put on my mask for so long. I was in a place where I couldn't remove it because of the regulations there. I stayed with it for about three, three, two hours. And when I left there, I was feeling abnormal. I mean, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Praise the Lord. But you see... That is not a comfortable thing for you and me. But no matter what it is, it doesn't affect my faith. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Nothing should affect your faith because Jesus has forewarned you things may not be in this world the way you expect them to be sometimes. You may go through some issues. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And when you go through them, Jesus knows. I know which there are things that you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. That you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. 10 days there means you'll have tribulation in the series of the 10 emperors who are coming from the first one to the second one. We know Titus. We know we came to Domitian. We went to Emperor Nero. We went to all those after the 10th emperor roman emperor at that time that's when now there was seizing of the tribulations and we are seeing it in the last in the last church praise the lord there will be 10 waves of this tribulation there will come an emperor will come because all this all these people who are being murdered were not murdered or they were not killed by one one emperor Roman Emperor. They were being killed by different ones during, the, depending on the time that you lived. But he says you will attend uh, this, but be faithful. Church, shout to me, be faithful. be faithful. 
You are not shouting. You shout, be faithful. Be faithful. Jesus is saying, be faithful. What does being faithful mean? Being faithful means stick with me. Yes. Hallelujah. Stick with the truth. He said you can overcome if you are eating the word of God. You are keeping yourself in the right environment. You have enough resource to, to face every challenge. The reason you see people changing to some funny character is because the environment they keep staying in is not building their faith. Simple. You need to be taking right seed and you need to be, you need to be eating the right word and you need to stay in the right environment. That naturally develops you into fruitfulness. There is no fruit without right seed and right environment. If you have a seed that is dropped on this hard carpet here, it will never germinate, right? Okay. If you have good soil here and there is no seed, there will never be fruit. But if you have the seed, which is the word of God, like you're hearing right now, and immediately you create the right environment within your heart, and that is a heart that is receptive and is agreeing to be led in the way of God, you do not discuss success and fruitfulness. You become fruitful in Christ Jesus. That is how it's generated. And if you make up our minds on that, brothers and sisters, we will all see ourselves growing and becoming what God wants us to become. Praise the Lord. That's verse what? That's verse 10, right? No? That's verse what? Verse 10? Okay. Verse 10. Is that verse 10? Okay, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to put you, to some of you, into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is hard gospel. How, do, how, for, to, how, how far do you hold your faithfulness? Until? Hallelujah. Be faithful until death. What does that mean? No option. No excuse. You will ever give to God. That will be good enough. Because if you stand your ground and you die. And that's why the first century church loved that last bit. I told you of the letter written by... Uh, Ignatius, the bishop of Syria in the second century, in the first century really and uh, second century and he wrote a letter to his followers saying please I'm being surrounded by lions and they want to kill me, he was being taken to Rome where he eventually died because of the gospel I'm being taken by these lions to be killed and then he writes a letter and says what? Please don't do what? You are in church don't save me please don't fight with them I really want to die for Jesus. Do me a favor and let me die. Today, that was the first, and that's what I'm telling you, we, we need to locate the church from the beginning because we are at the end. In the middle here, a lot of things happened. Too much things happened. Like we are going to see the church of Pergamos. Because the church of Pergamos means something else. And I'm going to show you the church of, the church of Spina, Spina, what it means. You see, the first church was so focused on Jesus. And they were keen on Jesus. And this is the church that Jesus did not say anything against. He did not say anything corrective. He said, I know, I know you are, you are, you are, you are in a tricky place. You are in a hard place. But you have not given up the faith. Keep it until death. Preach that today, pastor. And people feel like, what are you talking? We want them blessings. I say, Please just lay the hand on me, pastor. I just want to go and get this and get this and get this and get this. Did you know you will get that for a short time? It's okay. But it only makes sense when it's being gotten for the purpose of the eternal purpose that God has given you. That is the truth, my brother and my sister. Mind your life with Jesus. Mind your growth in the faith. Mind the time you spend with Jesus so that he may cause you to see what he is like. 
He may cause you to have a clear understanding of life. He may cause you to know, even if you are a millionaire, it will only make sense if your millions had access into eternal value. Yes. Because you will be there forever. I gave you an example of one man, a philosopher, who ta taught when I was eight years in church, in our AIC church, years back. I was a young boy, and he came, he was a, he was a professor, a real professor, and he taught about eternity. And this is what he told us, eternity is like this. You pick a bird that is picking one grain of soil from planet Earth to Mars. And it takes a thousand years to reach Mars and a thousand years to come back. So the bird begins today. One grain, it transports one grain to Mars a thousand years. And then it comes back home, 1,000. That makes how many, how many years? 2,000. So then it picks another one grain of soil from Earth. How long will it take it to transport the Earth to Mars? I think, huh? How many years? How many years? I think that is eternity. That's the way you should look at eternity. So, utachoka uko wewe kama utakuwa. Ukupata ufunua uko mahali. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Utasinywa, unasema, ati unasema, ah, na shukuru tu nimepenya tu. Ah, unimepenya tu. Eternity being, looking at, I could have been there. Because that's the justice of God. Yes, you are blessed. Yes, you are happy. You are walking the, the streets of gold. And you are happy. That's, that's why I'm encouraging you. Take heed what you do today. Amen. Your life, your eternity, your eternity matters now. It is not in that day that it will matter. Now is when you fall. Now is when you need to be willing. Like Polycarp, when he says, I have served the Lord 86 years. Please thrust the gold on me because I would not deny God for even a second. And then he said to the people, I am going to die in a moment. You are going to die forever. You're killing me because of Jesus. Please do it soon. In other words, as believers, we should not feel like there's anything that we would give an excuse about or for when it comes to our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You're supposed to order your family for the glory of Jesus. Shout a good man if you're here. You're supposed to order your business for the glory of Jesus. Order your money for the glory of Jesus. Order your dreams and future for the glory of Jesus. Let eternity be in view every day. Let the countless years we are going to live with the Lord be in view every day. Let not anything in this life become so big for you to be deflected from the goodness that the Lord has prepared for us. May God speak to our hearts. May we be encouraged. It is not a message to scare you. It's a message to remind you that the Lord loves you. He has a good plan for you. And if you make right decisions, you will really, really enjoy that eternity. Okay? So, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. He who does what church? Shout with me, I am an overcomer. Shout, I can overcome. At the back, are you with us? Praise the Lord. Shout, I. I have the power in Jesus' name to overcome. Your confession is so important. Say it with me again. I, I have the power by the grace of Jesus to overcome. Jesus expects me to overcome. Yes, he is the one who has given you the resources. He expects you to overcome. He expects me to overcome. And as you have overcome, as I overcome, as we overcome, Jesus is proud and he says, He that overcome shall not be hurt by the second. The second death will hurt. What is the second death? The second death is the death after you die, the physical death. It is the death of eternal separation from the Lord. Even the devil himself will have a second death. The first death, not really death. The first punishment. There are several of them. They have taken place on the cross. That was The first punishment was to be thrown out of the Garden of Eden. The second punishment, we see him being, uh, 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 being defeated by Jesus on the cross. He will be held during the one millennium years. He will be around here. He will grab by Jesus and put into that pit. For a thousand years he will stay there. That is the third punishment. And then the last one will be the eternal one where he will be cast into the lake of fire from where he will never come out again and there he will live forever and ever with those who never receive the 
gift of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. You will not be there if you have received the Lord Jesus Christ and kept the faith. So Jesus said he will not be hurt by the second death. In other words, there is a place for you. What a wonderful Jesus. There is a plan to keep you safe. There's a plan to keep you in the right direction. You cannot allow anything to deflect you from this glorious Jesus. It is him we owe all our allegiance and loyalty. Our loyalty. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's see something now down there. Now, to say something about Smyrna, the church, Smyrna, you see the tribulations that are taking place there? Uh, the Smyrna is a word coined from the word Maya, 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 M-Y-R-A. So Smyrna here speaks of a spice from a back of a tree which was crushed to release frankincense. In other words, that name Smyrna means the back of a tree which is crushed. You see the crushing of the tree which is about Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And the church in Smyrna had understood the cross so much that they did not mind to be crushed and to be persecuted for Jesus. Praise the Lord. Are you here church? And that is the reason Jesus is so proud of this church because the cross and the suffering of Jesus was so clear to them that they were not bothered by the things they go through. They were bothered by one thing, that they may remain faithful to the Lord. And they were living at a time when the church was being crushed. You're being slashed in a place like here. I gave you the story of Emperor Nero and how he would do it. He, would, he was a ruthless, the most ruthless and the most ugly man, they say, who ever lived among the emperors. Short, flat nose, bow-led, kipara, and funny guy who killed every one of their family. The wife, the mother, the mother-in-law killed all of them and they were not believers. He was an ugly man, this man. And he would come to a place like this. They would order everybody killed and would make them his torches in his compound as he spread his gown and, and, and rejoices as the emperor of the time. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. But with that kind of issues, Jesus says, I know where you live. I know the situations you're in. So church, this is it. God would desire that the cross, like the church of Smyrna, the cross of Christ and what Christ did have such an impact in us that we are not deflected by the things of this world. We are willing to say no. We are willing to move. And we have the power by the Holy Ghost. Because Christ has already redeemed us and made us his own. And that's why he's so confident about the church when he says, you can overcome. You are overcomers as you overcome. You who overcomes, you will overcome. He talks about overcoming, not being defeated. Because when your eyes are in the right place, you are empowered rightly. When your eyes are in the wrong place, you have a serious challenge of even figuring out what is happening in your life. Today, when you see people get look, uh, forming lines of prayer, those prayers, very little of them, have anything to do with their spiritual life. Are you here, church? Why do people form long lines of prayer? They want wife, they want money, they want... They want to be set free from their father's curses, generational curse. They feel like my father is the one who is making me not buy a car. My, mother is, my father is the one. I was just talking to a cousin of mine yesterday. She's not married. She's about, she has two children. And, and then she's saying, who is this who overturned who, in Cumberland? He overturned my calabash. <laughs> yani your... your she was asking, who is this who overturned my what? And that's the thinking, and she's in church somewhere. Now I want some serious person with serious prayer to turn around my calabash. You know, the problem is, she feels like I want this, I want this. What you need is Jesus and his revelation. Can you shout a good amen if you know what I'm talking about? Don't take the message of our Lord Jesus casually. It will haunt you in eternity. It is the Alpha and the Omega. We saw he seated in the midst of the lampstands and he has the stars in his right hand. There is nothing outside the control of our Lord Jesus. He is. 
Jesus, the one who holds things together according to the book of Colossians, he is the, 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 the right repre representation of the invisible God. He knows the beginning from the end. Pastor, is this enough? Yes, it's all you need. It is the enough thing you need. It is when you wake up in the morning, crush through your book of Colossians prayerfully. Let the Holy Ghost speak to you. Amen. My wife was giving me a testimony yesterday. They went to see my father-in-law. We know the wife went to be with the Lord. And so they were concerned. The sisters, uh, younger sisters, not her. The younger sisters were there and they are telling Mze, Oh, Mze, are you okay? Are you okay? Until Mze sat them down, all of them. He told them, you are the ones who are bringing trouble. <laughs> True? They were shocked. The, the, the sons-in-law, they were there, all of them yesterday. Because they wanted to help him come from Rabbi. Because he, he overstayed in Rabbi. He said, I want to be with my brother. So he came. He, he, he drove his car home. And they came with him. And he seated there and they are wondering. We were coming to see whether he will be able to handle the entering of the house without the wife. And then they were shocked. He's the one who knows what needs to be done, what needs to be done. And in the burial, those who were there, you heard him say, my wife has just gone somewhere and I'll be joining her soon. And people said, said God forbid. There were believers there, God forbid. God forbid what? He will all go. Jesus said, I'm coming soon. It's now 2,000 years. And it's soon, still soon. So your soon may be 10 years, your soon may be 50 years, your soon may be 100 years. He did not say, I'm committing suicide. He said, I'll go soon. Wasn't he talking like the Lord Jesus? You know the problem with the church? The church doesn't want to face the truth and get comfortable with the truth and be okay with the truth. They want to be scared. You walk like somebody who is traveling from here to Nairobi and you can't sleep. You're... You are watching whether the driver may knock another car. Are you able to control it? <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You are not enjoying your journey. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. You need a revelation of Jesus. What is wrong if you went? What would be so wrong if you went? Let me ask you that question. I'm asking serious stuff here. Because Jesus says, be faithful to, to death. Then I'm going to give you eternal life. So was Jesus scared of death? Talk to me. Was Jesus scared of death? Was Peter scared of death? Was Polycarp scared of death? Praise the Lord. Why? They had been schooled in the truth. Paul said in one of his comments, he said, I'm amply supplied. He also said, I know how to be in much and how to be in little. He also said, none of these things move me. He also said, I, for me to live in Christ is Christ and to die is death. He also said, I see I'm about to be poured. And he talked about how the Lord is waiting for him. Stephen talked about, I see the Lord. He's being stoned. He's not seeing stones. You need the revelation of Jesus to see beyond what you're going through. That's what you need in the church. And we we'll get that, brothers and sisters, we'll enter that door with, uh, with praises, with hands lifted up. We have nothing to move us. We are stronger than life itself. We are bigger than death. Are we saying we are going to die? No. God is going to bless us to live, to proclaim his word. And when it's true, we'll be joined together with our forefathers happily and rejoicing. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise Jesus. Amen. Are you getting what we are saying? Can you tap your neighbor? Tell them, be rooted. be rooted. No, you're not telling them properly, Lord. Tell them, be rooted. Be rooted. You will stop suffering. No, you did not hear what I've said. Be rooted. You will stop, stop suffering. Because many people are suffering mentally because I want this, I want this, I want this. When it delays for one week, you have no peace with anybody. Why is sister so and so being blessed? Oh, look at her. Look. Please have the revelation of Jesus. And you will stop mental suffering. You will find peace in Jesus. The book of Revelation reminds you. 
which will keep you in check and you'll enjoy your life. Hallelujah. Are you getting something, church? So smino meant experience of the cross because it simply means that back of the tree and it speaks about Jesus. You can check that in Isaiah 16. Okay? It's a place of crushing. It's a place of tribulation, a place of persecution. And Jesus doesn't give any corrective exhortation. He doesn't, he doesn't give any corrective exhortation. Why? When you are such. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. When you are such at heart, Jesus can only be proud of you. But in the following church, which I will not say much about, which is the church of Pagamos, Pagamos, which means, and I will go to that later, Pagamos, which is a word from the city, is coined from two words, Paga and Mos. Paga means perversion. Mos means marriage. So, perverted marriage. At this time, the emperor is Constantine, the following church, Pagamos. I want to compare with the two so that I finish. Pagamos is, Paga means perversion. Mos means marriage. So, a perverted marriage. At this time, Constantine, who was the emperor about 400 years later, he, he says to the church, he's a Roman emperor, he says, I've seen the cross, so I think and I believe I have seen Jesus. So the church receives Constantine and the church and the state become one. That's a perverted what? Marriage. So there is no longer persecution. Because the, the president and the bishop are friends. So what happens? What do you think suffers there? The church suffers. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What was God's plan? Let the government continue its work. Let the church continue her work. The church constitution is the gospel. It's the word of God. It is faith. It is not written in letters. It's written in the heart. We believe in the love of God and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever rejects that must be at longer hands with the church and the church should never be meant to feel like it's apologetic for declaring Jesus is the only way. Praise the Lord. And Jesus would like the entire world to know that in love, not in judgment. You tell the people, if you want eternal life, because even if they don't believe now, they will believe one day, but their belief then will not, will not be able to help them. You get the point? So it's your duty not to allow that perversion. And there's a perversion now. There's some perversion in the, the, written in the book of Pagamos, in the, in the letter to the Pagamos, is the perversion we are seeing in the church today. Where the things of the world and the things of the kingdom have married each other and what is suffering is the things of the kingdom. We need to be clear in our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that he is able to supply. God has no deficiency of resources for his children. He doesn't. He doesn't. But you see, we present a wrong motive, a wrong idea why we want things. Because we need to be so pure in our hearts. We are loving the Lord. We really want the money. And we know that money can only come from God. And we go join hands, praise him, grow in Jesus. And you will miraculously see how the Lord is going to raise the church to standards no man can fathom. And your life too. Praise the Lord. So brothers and sisters, when we hold firm to the truth, like the church of Smyrna, the Lord Jesus is proud. It's like, this is how Jesus is doing, and I'm through now. Jesus is doing like this. I want to demonstrate to you. Jesus is in heaven. You are going through a situation, but your praise is up there. Amen? It's like Jesus is saying, he's clapping. You getting the point? Are you here? Do you see anywhere Jesus standing up on his feet to receive a general like in the place of Stephen? What was going on? Remember, I don't believe Jesus was only standing because Stephen was being stoned and he's standing his ground. Prior to the stoning, look at the message he has preached. About, is it two chapters? 
terrific preaching, taking them to the book of Genesis, trying to correlate the entire Bible and telling them of your fathers, and he's telling everything about the Jews coming to the prophets all the way, narrating the entire Bible, and then he concludes, now this is the Messiah. And then the Bible says those words pierce them to their hearts. Jesus felt adequately represented. What a representative. Jesus felt I would not have done better. I would have done it the same way. Stephen has done it. And he stands and says, Welcome, General. That's one of the men I want to see when I get there. He was a mere deacon. Not ordained like Polycarp was ordained by John the Apostle. Can you imagine being ordained by John the Apostle? Laying hand on you. And Peter like the bishop of, uh, of, of Syria, Peter. Clement, ordained by Peter. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So Jesus stands up and salutes him. And said, well done. And Stephen is able to look from where he is. And there's this stone. The pain of stones is not greater than the vision of Jesus. And he says, I see the Lord standing and he was received into eternity. Our faith is a glorious faith. Yeah. It is bigger than death. Yeah. It is bigger than sufferings. Yeah. It is bigger than lacking rent. Oh, I'm not going to church. I have no rent. I have to run to that kibanda of mine. Please. Am I, am I now condemning you by telling you the truth? On Sunday morning, we are here worshiping the Lord. You feel the urge to open your tomato kibanda. It should not be that way. And it should not be a command. When you see Jesus, your worries are drowned away. There is peace and fulfillment. Let's stand up on our feet, brothers and sisters. Stand up on your feet. Lift up your hands to him. The keyboardist, please, if you can get here. Lift up your hands. Let us worship Jesus. In the next five minutes, let's just bless him. Please open your mouth. Bless him. Father, we give you praise. Just take a moment of worship. It's your personal agenda. You know what you've been hearing. Everybody has been hearing their own thing. I don't know what the Holy Ghost has been speaking to you. Just lift up your voice to him. Just raise your voice to him. And we say, it. let us not just mama. Lift up your voice. Let it come out in Jesus' name. Don't mind about your friend, your brother. This is about you and Jesus. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the peace. Thank you for your glorious, glorious word. We thank you, Lord, because you're calling us a reminder. Us, Lord. You are reminding us, Lord Jesus, of something bigger than this life that we have. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we yield ourselves to you. We yield ourselves to you, Heavenly Father. We yield ourselves, mighty Father, to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we say yes to your plan. We say yes to your will. We say yes to your purpose as Heavenly Father. Lord, help us today. We pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord God, your wisdom will flood our minds. Your wisdom will flood our minds. Just lift up your voices and let us pray. And let us just thank God for his goodness. Just accept that the Lord is faithful. He is good in your life and is more than enough. He is more than enough in your life. He is the everlasting father. He is the everlasting father. Maybe maybe as we, as we join our hands together in prayer as we join our hands together in prayer Please just bow your head where you are. I want to ask you a few questions. If you look in your life, into your life, deep into your life, if you sense after hearing what you're hearing this week and last week and today, you sense in your heart there is something you need to do. There are some decisions you need to take. There is some refocusing you need to do. And you know that is what you're hearing. I challenge you to immediately take those decisions. When the Lord is speaking, that is your day of opportunity.
that's your day that the grace of the Lord is there to lift you up, to lift you up. Don't fear anything, to lift you out of your challenge, to lift you out of your fear and concern. And you will sense the revitalization of his spirit. Just now, raise up your hands, everyone, as I pray. Just both of you, let's lift up our hands to him. Ever lift up in the name of Jesus. I pray for your people in this house today. And I ask, Lord, that none of them, after hearing this, will remain the same. I ask, Lord God, that the Spirit of the Father will engulf their lives, will move over them, Lord God, will remind them, Lord, of the great purpose that you have with them. I ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, rebuking every situation and standing against every, every situation that brings defocus in their lives. The Lord, you're going to cause there to be newness in our minds, to be newness in everything that we do. We think right, we focus on the right things, that Christ may be a exalted in us. Father, we give you praise. We worship you and we glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And maybe you are there. Maybe you are there, seated among us, and you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There is nothing to be shy about. This is the greatest decision you can ever do. To tell Jesus Today, I make you my Lord and my Savior. Are you there? That is your prayer today. You need to be born again. Are you there? Amen. Maybe all of us here are born again. But I want us to join with our audience online and the people who are watching us through the media in praying that prayer. So let us pray. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I thank you today. I've heard your word. That you are the only one who can give eternal life. You are the first and the last. You are the beginning and the end. Today I accept you. I accept your forgiveness. And I believe you died for me. And with my mouth I confess. You are my Lord and Savior. You died on the cross for me. You rose for me. And you live, you live forever for me. Today, I make you my Lord. And I accept forgiveness in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let us give the Lord a clap of rain in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. We may be seated. Let me make one announcement before I sit down. Hallelujah.